This is Popping the Bubble with hosts Sandra Ponce de Leon and Pete A. Turner. Hi, this is Rania Hote, co founder and CEO of ID4A, and we are on Popping the Bubble. Hey, Rania. Yeah, hey, what's going on? Hello. Thanks for sitting down with us. Yeah, thanks for being here on Popping the Bubble. We're so excited to have you. Thank you so much. I'm excited to have you too. <laughs> Yes, you're even serving us wonderful tea. Um, Rania, you have an amazing background. You're the co-founder and CEO of ID4A Technologies, which is a San Francisco-based design tech company. You have an experience, a wide background in environmental design, industrial design, product development, user experience. You've worked with amazing companies like GE, Jet Propulsion Lab, NASA, Walmart, Amtrak. You've been recognized by the White House. I mean, you're really just amazing. So um, we are so excited to have you here. Thank you. So I'd love to just kind of kicking us off. Um, I'd love to just find out a little bit more about you and what brought you to here, San Francisco, becoming the co-founder of your own company. Um, tell us about yourself. Sure. I, I might go in a very unconventional route to talk about myself. You Please made the, you made a like beautiful introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. I think that all mankind are divided into three categories. There are the immovable people, there are the movable, and there are those that move. And I think I'm one of those that move. I have a um, great force, ambition, and dynamism to initiate new ideas, and I think that's the main uh, reason why I do what I do. I am very much um, uh, driven by making change and making turning points. And that says a lot about my restless nature as a human being. So yeah, I'm, I'm driven to engage with the world and to forge ahead with plans and also to be able to show the way to other people. And that's something that I'm very passionate about. And that makes me committed to my own vision. And I tend to balance forces of people around me and that helps me to build the bridges that I need in order to support my efforts to grow my own business and also to support the initiatives that I lead to help other people. Mm -hmm. So you talked about your vision. What What is your vision? <laughs> you know, I, I have a very broad vision in terms of what kind of goals I want to achieve, whether that is through the business that I that I run or through the initiatives that I lead in education and women empowerment, gender equality. I think that um, uh, for me, I want to be able to contribute as much as I can while I am here. I want to be able to use my talents, my ideas, my energy also in order to lead things forward and help other people achieve that if they need that kind of energy and support system as well. I, I'm a total polymath and I have a very significant number of, uh, of expertise in different areas. And me being a person who travels a lot and I, I have a very nomadic and exploratory nature and I tend to infuse that into what I do and with my engagement with other people. So my personal experience has always been multicultural and also my intellectual training has always been multidisciplinary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, you talk a little bit about wanting to inspire others with the work that you're doing. And I think, you know, it's, it's reflected in some of the recognition that you're getting these days. And you were recently even recognized by the White House and participated in what's called the CTE Makeover Challenge. So maybe can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Uh, so this past year has been um, pretty amazing. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. There are so many things coming my way. A lot of uh, recognitions. Actually, there was three recognitions by the White House. That That's I'm, amazing. Congrats. I'm greatly, greatly grateful for. Thank you so much. You know, with, with recognition also comes more responsibility is that you start to initiate and then all of a sudden your, your work has been seen and um, that gets overwhelming, but also it makes you feel that you need to do more. With the City e Makeover Challenge in particular, it was uh, a challenge that was initiated by the U U.S. Department of Education. Mm -hmm. And CTE refers to career and technical education, just uh, for clarity. The competition was about inviting schools from across the United States to submit makerspace designs that are scalable, affordable, and replicable. Mm -hmm. 
And That's cool. um, yeah, it's the first time they do this. And, and I got very excited about it because I was already active in the space. So basically, uh, schools submitted their designs to uh, what kind of facilities that they want to have in, in their schools. And makerspace is just for our audience as well. If they're not familiar with the terms, makerspace is basically a facility that provides resources, materials, and equipments for students to learn through the process of making. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is also set up to so things like 3D design and 3D printing, exactly. all of those things. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. Advanced software tools to to CNCs, 3D printers, laser cutters. Basically using modern tools in order to innovate through collaboration and hands-on projects, which mm-hmm. is the, the main uh, uh, objective of this type of learning is to integrate different kinds of skills by using modern technologies. And the competition itself was open back in March of 2016. And we received about 650 submissions from schools. Mm-hmm. Of like public schools All public nationally? Schools, okay. Yes, uh, from, from across the United States. We uh, went through a process of scoring and reviewing all these proposals, and then we had to select 10 finalists that received the funding from the government. And if anybody is in New York City in October, there will be a showcase for the CTE Makeover uh, Challenge for the Makerspace uh, Showcase, and uh, that will take place at the World Maker Fair in New York City in October, wow. on October 1st, 2016. Very cool. Very cool. So so why do you think it's important for schools to have access to this kind of learning experience within, you know, a maker environment? You know, one of the um, most important things about this is that making in itself is a hands-on learning approach that encourages students to imagine, create through the process of manufacturing, testing, visualization, and demonstrating ideas. So through making, educate, educators can enable students to immerse themselves in problem solving and iteration. And in the process, they're also learning essential 21st century career skills, such as critical thinking, planning, Mm -hmm. and communication. And making is closely aligned with the objectives of the career and technical education because it's it's a natural environment to foster thinking through experimentation with technology, engineering, and science, and it prepares students with academic and technical skills and employability skills that eventually can help them succeed in a modern economy, which is the, the main reason why this is very important. Right. I mean, we've had you know several conversations recently with people that talk about the importance or really the coming trends, emerging trends with automation and what are going to be the important school skills for students in particular in terms of creativity and really awakening that creativity is going to be a key differentiator for kids as they grow up, you know, because so many things are going to be automated in the coming years that you really have to be able to, you know, think about how you leverage these different skill sets to create something new that wasn't there before. So that's, a, that's amazing. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting space. I, I've been active when I received the invitation from the US Department of Education, I've been active in this in the education space for the for the last two years so I've worked with hundreds of schools around California and, and the whole country to help them integrate design education and technical education within their curriculums, which which is something that a lot of schools are trying to work on. So when when I received this invitation, it was mainly recognizing also my efforts in the space and that being in alignment with what the government is trying to do. Mm-hmm. That is an impressive bit of learning that kids are doing too. Even if you don't win, being in that environment, and, and I'm, I'm really big on being in the workshop and doing things, mistakes are lessons. Those things are fabulous. So I was looking on my phone at some of the schools that won, and these schools all rate highly. They're really doing a great job in teaching kids. And not only are you teaching them math and science and those things, but now you're teaching them something that's act directly applicable to building and making things. I think that's just a a fantastic uh, approach to a very tough problem of teaching people. How did you get involved with, with the challenge? So I got involved with the challenge. Somehow, I, I, my name got to the government in terms of the work that I was doing because I was uh, actively mentoring students around schools. I was working closely with a lot of schools on integrating design technical skills in their, uh, in their cur- curriculums. And, and I was working closely with the students to help them also on developing technical design skills, but also making educational decisions and career decisions 
decisions on what to do next. Mm -hmm. So you know, and, and making career decisions across different areas of design and technology. So that's how I got involved in the challenge. Uh, in, in this challenge, I, I got the invitation based on the work I was doing. So they learned about what I'm doing. Uh, there was also a uh, public nomination process, I believe, mm -hmm. for for selecting uh, the judges and and the review panel mm -hmm. and I think that directly went from the schools and people that were wor working closely with and people that are in the, in the industry so there was about a total of 50 people that were mm -hmm. selected from the entire country from uh, different individuals of innov innovators and uh, organization leaders that were active in the makerspace industry that got on board. I think that that's, there's something to be said for that when you are working with students and seeing the things that they create, that probably provides so much inspiration also back to you, which is, you know, probably, you know, really exhilarating. Yeah, the, one of the most interesting things about mentoring students in high school phase particularly is the reason why I got into the space, because when I was in high school, I had no support system personally. Mm -hmm. I, I grew up in Lebanon and I went to school in Lebanon until I finished high school and then I came to the United States to the United States to go to college. So during that phase, when I when I was trying to make career decisions and educational decisions on what to do next with my life, there was no support system for me. So a lot of that process had to be me, right? <laughs> my own learning curve in order to find my passion. And also design education, there was no solid design education in, in high schools. And that's also common in, in the US as well. But here we still have the opportunity to get access more because there is more appreciation to to the arts in general and there is more funding to schools and things like that so from a personal experience I wanted to be of help to other people knowing how difficult it is to make these decisions at this particular time and especially being in a place where you're interested in going into creative fields and you're not sure what to do you're not getting the support that you need either from family from the school from society, mm -hmm. you know, so there is a lot of pressure on students at this age to make decisions that they're not ready to make. They're too fragile. They're too underdeveloped. Yeah. Uh, not, not in a negative way, it's just the process of personal development. They're not at a stage where they're capable of making solid decisions and they need a lot of guidance. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them also don't necessarily have a strong self-esteem, again, due to lack of support, whether from family, society, school. Their, their environment that they're in is not necessarily supportive to their dreams and talents. Um, so it kind of creates that connection with them to also help them tap into things that they're not aware of about themselves and redirect them into areas that they didn't necessarily think about before. Right. Yeah, that's amazing. It's so great that you can be such an inspiration to these young people. That's um, awesome. I think that there should be more of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying to. Okay. <laughs> but there is a lot more of you. You are a busy woman. <laughs> there is more. You do so much more. Can you tell us a little bit about your company and what you guys do? Yes, so ID4A is a design technology company. We are specialized in building software tools uh, for the design for manufacturing industry. We develop customized uh, software tools for advanced manufacturing processes, working with uh, R&D and R&D phases with a lot of companies. We also help makers, designers, innovators, engineers, product developers that are trying to develop manufacturable products from mm -hmm. idea stage to prototype, manufacture, distribution to market. So we guide them through the entire process and help them to push a product to the market. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that's pretty core to what you do is what we call design thinking. Could you talk a little bit about exactly what design thinking is? Yes. So design thinking is a proven methodology and a repeatable problem-solving protocol that is used by designers to solve complex problems and find desirable solutions. And I want to clarify one thing about terminology itself. Design is most often used to describe an object or an end result, but design in its most effective form is actually a process. It's an action, mm -hmm. a verb. It's not a noun. And design thinking is, it combines creative and critical thinking to allow for information and ideas to be organized and decisions to be made to improve certain situations and to gain more knowledge. Mm -hmm. And design mindset is 
not problem focused, which is very different from how critical thinking works. So design thinking is focused on solution and it's very action oriented towards creating a better result. And what design thinking seeks to do is to build ideas up versus critical thinking is about breaking them down. Hmm. So that's more to understand how the process works. So it draws upon logic imagination, intuition, systematic reasoning, so we could explore possibilities of what could be and to create desired outcomes that benefit the end user and the consumer. So any business or profession can employ design thinking to achieve extraordinary results. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's, uh, it's very important to develop design thinking keep capabilities and it's very crucial to any organization to have that and a lot of people think that you have to be a designer in order to apply this methodology but actually design thinking is about teaching and training others to think like a designer not mm. to be a designer it takes uh, many years to become a good designer but you can still think like one so so that's how the the methodology was developed because Do you have an example of how you would think like a designer finding a solution so design begins with setting a strategic intention. So mm -hmm. that's something that um, we need to understand. So if you are mapping out a strategy, for example, then you are designing. You can design the way you lead, the way you manage, create, innovate. And methods for thinking like a designer, to give you an example, is observing, for experimenting with idea generation, interviewing, creating personas, empathy mapping. Mm -hmm storyboarding, associational thinking, critical thinking, aesthetic ways of knowing, problem solving, rapid prototyping, decision making analysis. So in other words, it's a whole brain creative thinking process that could be implemented and repeated and re replicated as such by following these, these methods that are usually the methods that are used by a designer to execute on a design project. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. How do you prevent the design from dominating the experience? Because you can design something. It doesn't mean that the reality, you know, like you're a CEO, someone who's at the very bottom rungs of your organization is equally important. But if they don't understand the design, if their actions don't match your design, your strategic focus, then you can't advance the strategic outcome because the bottom isn't working in conjunction with the top. How do you use design to cover for that vertical? I, I get that you can go wide and everything else, but how do you handle that vertical communication? Create like path? organizational cohesiveness. From an, yeah. yeah. From an organizational standpoint, I I think that we are at a at a stage where being a CEO, for example, you are at the center of your company. So the model that you're talking about in terms of vertical integration mm -hmm. in your organization is becoming a dated model. And that's because design thinking came into play and it's becoming applied into organizational um, processes. So, for example, now as a CEO, you no longer look at the organization from a vertical standpoint. You look at it from more of a circular standpoint. So you're at the center of a circle and you have a 360 degrees view of what's happening around you and you're able to to equally see everyone around you within your team within your organization at the same distance if you were to imagine for example a circle and being in the middle you have equal access to everyone if you were to be in the center rather than being on the top and having that um, vertical hierarchy that, yeah, hierarchical structure exactly and that also um, this kind of organizational system allows for collaboration much easier mm. and uh, placing the CEO in the center actually helps them to map out skills of people around them so I could look right, left, front, back, at any angle, I'm capable to see John would be really great if he were to work with Mary. And I could see if Pete should never work with That's true. Anne or, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, because you, you're no longer detached from people around you. You're not above them. You're not detached from them. And you're dependent on one messenger mm -hmm. to, to give you a report of what's happening all the time. So, you know, so it changes also the dynamics in terms of how you work with your team, but how also your team perceives you because there's that visibility, there's transparency also within that model, mm -hmm. which creates much um, better collaboration and higher productivity. Mm -hmm. 
I understand that that part, you have a, a greater view of your company, but you still write the checks. You still say you can't come to work anymore, you know, and that does create a hierarchical kind of thing. You can have transparency, but there are CEO level decisions. And my time in the military, one of the things they don't do is they don't give us too much information. You know, like, hey, show up at this time, you know, not like, hey, uh, we're planning on being at a, a certain point at a certain time. We're not sure what it's going to be yet. You can't give everybody every bit of information because that'll create chaos and people want more. So you can't be truly transparent. You can be revealing, but at some point your work is different than everybody else's work. Oh yes, absolutely. But by transparency, I don't mean that no privacy or right. or hierarchy is not lost in that in mm-hmm. that sense. It's just reorganized in a different way. Mm-hmm. I think that's that's what I'm referring to. Yeah. So I, I guess that's one one of the things that's very important about applying design thinking to organizations, that transparency and that sort of level playing field where everyone is aware of what's happening in your closer connection to your team. I, this is sort of a two-part question. A, how do you do that at scale? And right. secondly, you know, what are the other reasons why this design thinking is so important to apply to an organizational structure? Well, the design way of thinking can be applied to pretty much any systems, any procedures, any protocols, and customer user experiences. So the purpose of design is ultimately to improve the quality of life. Mm -hmm. And the simple truth about design thinking is that it is the most powerful tool when it's used effectively and it could it can be the foundation to drive any brand or business forward so so what are the other reasons why design thinking is so important to an organizational structure so the design way of thinking is applicable to any systems procedures protocols and customer user experiences and the purpose of design is ultimately to improve the quality of life for people and the simple truth about design thinking is that it is the most powerful powerful tool if it if it if it is used effectively and it can be the foundation for driving any brand or business forward is it because you're taking that empathetic view and you're really taking the customer or the organization and get, getting yourself into their shoes? Is that the power of design thinking? Because it seems to me, though, that a lot of what you're saying in terms of the transparency, the horizontal view um, when it comes to design thinking is about, and also in terms of creating products, is about that the, you mentioned empathy. And so I'm thinking design thinking, is that really taking the customer view? And the customer can be the employee, it could be the customer, but but really taking their view deeper into the design from the beginning, right? Yeah, so so there is multiple levels to that. For example, if we were to implement design thinking at, as the core strategy develop at the core of strategy development and organizational change in the company, it will be to create the culture that is focused on this way of solving problems. Mm-hmm. And this way of thinking can be applied to products, services, processes, anything that needs to be improved. So when design principles are applied to strategy and innovation, the success rates for innovation are actually dramatically improved. And that's that's been uh, proven by looking at design-led companies. If, if we just look at companies such as Apple or mm-hmm. IBM or Nike, Procter & Gamble, for example, uh, Whirlpool, all these companies have been able to outperform the S&P 500 by at least 219% mm. in the last 10 years. So Great design has that wow factor that makes products more desirable and services more appealing to users. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the methodologies that are used in order to arrive to these results that we discussed. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so that's that's pretty much it. Right, kind of having the psychology of the customer in the the process itself, the creation process, the design process, strategy development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So let's just switch gears for a little bit. What is it that inspires you? What gets you up out of bed in the morning? (laughs) You know, I drive my inspiration from different places. I think inspiration has two faces. There is internal motivation and there is external triggers. And for me, it, it really depends on the environment. I'm always observant. So I'm always looking for pieces of information that can really get my mind going on, on certain issues, problems to solve, because I'm, I'm very also solution oriented. And I'm usually very inspired by 
people of different experiences, different backgrounds. I, I love diversity. And for me, I feed off of that. And I love listening to what other people have to say. And I learned so much through, the, through that process. And that gets me usually very inspired to take action. Because when I listen to somebody's problem, I want to solve it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, tell me, tell me what the problem is. So I could, how, how much I time could do you come have? up with a solution. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so in my mind, I it's it's very focused on that. It's very. I tend to have a, a bit of an optimistic uh, view on things, and I'm always looking for opportunities to make improvements. I am very much inspired by art, music, design, of course, mm -hmm. literature. I'm, I'm an avid reader. I love philosophy and poetry, and I do write as well. So, wow, oh, cool. Um, So yeah, so I, I find inspiration in diversity and problems and in arts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you can see that it's reflected in your background and all the different disciplines that you're involved with. It's very cool. So as a, as a, as a founder of a company, do you have some, some wisdom to impart some lessons that you'd like to share with other people that are embarking on their entrepreneurial journey? Yes, uh, one of the most common things that I've experienced myself from being a founder and also from mentoring and advising a lot of founders and in, in different industries. One of the major lessons that I would say is learn how to be authentic and learn to have integrity and be true to yourself no matter what situation is in, uh, imposed upon you. It's very easy when you are in the business world to start to shift your personality in order to, you, you just compromise a lot because you're trying to make ends meet in certain ways. And sometimes it's very easy to lose your identity in this kind of process. So it's it's very important to stay connected to who you are as a, as a human being, as a person, and why you're here and why you're doing what you're doing. Because it's there's that tendency to just shift and want to follow uh, somebody else's lead or somebody else's vision that might not necessarily be in alignment with yourself. So mm -hmm. it's good to stay aware of that and resist it if you feel it's not aligning with you. Also being willing to confront yourself on a regular basis and have a positive, constructive uh, self-talk hmm. to quickly learn from mistakes and, you know, free yourself from patterns that don't really serve your purpose. A lot of people tend to be afraid of admitting to themselves that they need to change, for example, or whatever they're doing is just a pattern and it's not giving them the, the result that they want because, again, their actions are, is not aligning with that vision. Also, don't be afraid to challenge conventions and do things differently that than everyone else is doing. Again, that comes with being more connected to your own identity and your own vision as, a, as an individual away from other influences and, and uh, pressures. Also, listen to other people's needs because you can learn a lot and work on meeting those needs. Because as a, as a founder, if your ego is, is in the way, it could definitely damage the growth of your business if you don't if you can't listen and you can't meet people's needs you have to have that kind of compassion when you're doing business as well it can't just be transactional about making money yeah um and also be fearless speak up a lot of people have a tendency not to say what they really want to say or or say what's on their mind because they want to please other people i think it's very important to um to also embrace fear and discomfort and take actions and don't spend too much time holding back and over analyzing because getting to places requires a lot of work and energy so yeah so that that's very very that. important that is so much wisdom right there so <laughs> yeah no kidding be authentic stay true to yourself watch your ego watch, watch your, your ego, ego. Be fearless. <laughs> don't be follow, self aware. Yeah, know where you're going. So know you don't follow going. someone's lead if you don't need to. They're not in line yeah, with yours. That's, that's great. Those are awesome, awesome lessons. Meet other people's needs to listen mm -hmm. to people's needs. It's very important because that's where you build the compassion and, and the connection and, and loyalty mm -hmm. with your customers, with your employees, with your investors, partners, whoever you're working with. Compassion is very, very important. Yeah. So give of yourself a lot. Too. Yeah. One more thing. I would say is also to learn new skills and mm. enjoy challenges. Take take challenges as a sport, and 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 learn to uh, 
to advance yourself all the time because people also get comfortable. Sometimes you think that, okay, I, I gained the knowledge that I need and now I'm applying it. It's giving me great results. So I don't need to do anything. <laughs> the fact is that you always have to evolve. And mm -hmm. uh, in order to do that, you need to keep learning and, and taking in new challenges, both at a professional and at a personal level. And also trust yourself. A lot of people have doubts, especially when you're a startup founder, a lot of doubts build up because you're, you're just, there's so much uncertainty in the process of, of doing business and being an entrepreneur. Right. But there is strength in being able to trust yourself, not your ego, trust your intuition and, and being able to, to exude that so other people can trust you and you could trust other people as well. Because having that built-in fear with yourself, that insecurity will definitely keep you away from building building any kind of healthy, trustful connection with anyone else around you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's very important to, to business and to life. Absolutely. Such wise words. <laughs> how did you, how, I mean, how did you learn all of this? I mean, what, what kind of work have you done yourself to get to this point where you are able to be so self-aware and also trusting of yourself and your instinct? I have a, an innate, <laughs> it's, it's hard to describe that, but I have a very strong innate ability to see through people. For example, I am very capable of of understanding where people are coming from and it, there's something natural about it mm -hmm. at the same time there I've been through many experiences where I've learned to for example let go of my ego and be more aware that okay now this is what it is that the what's holding me back in this particular situation from moving forward is because I am holding on to my ego rather than looking at the situation from a more detached standpoint and I think those kind of experiences really over year, over the years of course they helped me to shape that healthy relationship with myself and becoming much more objective and being able to separate between my actions the result and who's doing that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so putting myself outside so I could see things clearly and um, and just talk talk to myself and say you know here you messed up and here you need to assert yourself more here you need to take responsibility so it's a lot of trust trial and error from personal experiences, but you need to be really connected to pick up on these learning experiences because a lot of people could go through the same thing, but Absolutely. not come out of that, you know, evolved to it, to another level in their personal evolutionary process. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lots to, I think, uh, think about and digest there. Mm -hmm. And just in terms of what you said, I think it's great that you've got so much wisdom and you're so young and you've, um, you know, achieved so much already. I think <clears throat> one of the things that really fascinates me about your background is that you are so multicultural and you have this very diverse mm -hmm. background. You've come from Lebanon and you've only been in the United States, I think something like 10 years. Can you talk a little bit about how having that multicultural perspective um, benefits you and your work and, and how you how it's important um, in terms of applying a design thinking to, to the work that you do? Sure. Um, from a personal standpoint, yeah, I grew up in Lebanon for my, my entire life until I came to the States when I graduated high school. So I came here, I was a little bit over 18 years old. I think that that experience itself, moving from home, being here on my own, it really taught me a lot. I think I I grew so fast in a very short period of time just because of that. I had to work so many jobs. I had no financial support from, from my family. So I moved here. I wanted to go to the best schools. I wanted to, I had so much ambition and I wanted to make the best out of this, this experience. And I didn't realize how difficult it was until I was here on my own no money in the bank wow. <laughs> I my, my parents literally sent me to the states with a thousand dollars in my pocket so I, I had that was it that was like this is your money <laughs> go, wow. go 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 bon to school voyage. we love you <laughs> <laughs> so so it's hard to look back at this particular part of my life and not think like how difficult it was and how much I've been ignoring the fact that it was difficult because I you know when you are in these situations you're just looking for solutions and you just want to move you can't just be stuck thinking I'm, I I have a lack there is lack in my life you're you go after things and you try to to secure yourself so so yeah so in terms of you know being from a multicultural background I think what that helped me in where I'm at today is having 
having the open mindedness, being being exposed to multiple cultures, knowing multiple languages is really huge for being exposed to to more knowledge base. Like you have a wider knowledge base, you you get access to more philosophies, you get access to more literature, you understand cultures in a different way, and that all creates your personality and and that transcends into everything that you do and how you deal with people. The more open you are and the more diversity you're exposed to, more likely that you're going to have healthier relationships with people and you're going to be more empathetic, sympathetic, compassionate, more understanding. You're going to have multiple points of views to look at things uh, rather than than one. Mm -hmm. That's from a personal perspective. And from a design perspective, you know, design is all about developing solutions to problems by evolving the human perspective in all steps of the problem solving process. So by observing problems, for example, within a context and uh, brainstorming, conceptualizing, developing, and this is how you grow into implementing a solution that embodies that understanding of that human perspective. Yeah, and and it is a a design is a a human-centered approach. And in that, having access to understanding people from different angles becomes crucial in the implementation process and in the in the research process as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, and I think that, yeah, the multicultural background, I mean, one of the things that I've always loved just being able to speak multiple languages, I think that does deepen the connection that you can explore with people and, and just to be able to um, have a conversation in their own language. There's a lot of words in the English language that aren't necessarily, or, or a lot of words in Spanish or in Italian that aren't necessarily words in English. So I think it's just, it, it expands your ability to communicate um, and really connect. Absolutely. I think it's one of the most beautiful outcomes of multiculturalism is to have, you know, that ability, as you mentioned, is to to have the ability to consider alternatives and alternative ways of thinking and seeing the world uh, through different people's eyes and experiences. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that definitely enhances our openness and creativity greatly, which tied back into uh, creativity and design, mainly because adapting to more than one culture culture can enable generating new ideas due to having cognitive flexibility. Right. And that could make any organization more creative if you're bringing more people with that kind of background. You can just imagine the the outcomes that you could get within the creative process as well and how much rich, richness could be infused into not only the process of looking at the problem, which what we talked about is having that multifaceted point of views, but also in the implementation that considers and is, is more hypersensitive to the needs of people from different different backgrounds and experiences as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'd see it as a huge strength for any organization to have diversity. And and it's great to see tech companies in Silicon Valley taking diversity on as more an initiative these days. Absolutely. Yeah, because, you know, that the openness is, uh, is a magical key, really, that unlocks creativity and access to new ideas and and more multifaceted problem solving capabilities, which is very advantageous to design. And I think that that's something that we get to luckily experience here in the United States because we live in such a diverse culture. Yeah. I mean, I went to school with people from all over the world, and we all had our own identities that were brought into the projects. And um, now we're working with clients. Also, we're working with people that are developing products for different types of people as well and they are from different backgrounds themselves so it's it's really a beautiful beautiful thing if you are open to be sensitive to the differences and accept them without being critical and uh, dismissive Right. Yeah. So I, I think that the last question and, and your background is so impressive, what you've done, what you continue to achieve, the, all of the recognition that you've gotten even just recently with this uh, Ambassador of the Year award that you just received. I think one of the keys to that is that you really are, are fearless and you are just going and, and basically just uh, striving for what you know what you want without um, being held back from a lot of the self-doubt, self-talk that I think many people do have. And I think that's the lesson that you've learned but what is it that makes you so fearless? Mm, I think one of the one of the major turning points in my life is 
when I was growing up, my family and I, we experienced a civil war in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. And there was this period, you know, there was successive wars. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, as a, as a little child, when you're growing up in an environment where you are on the go, your family is just running away, running away, running away, and you're just trying to find safety mm -hmm. everything else becomes so meaningless when you're just thinking about life from from a standpoint that life is so fragile mm -hmm. and when it's threatened all what you care about is survival you just want to be here you just want to stay here even though we don't know what's on the other side mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we don't know <laughs> and we still don't have a proof of that so so it's just having that uh, being in touch with death at a very close uh, proximity mm -hmm. and um, and seeing a lot of trauma with the family and a lot of displacement and life becomes so meaningful but so meaningless at the same time where you just become at peace with mortality and I think once you're at that stage everything else just dissolves and you feel that your energy is all about moving forward and there's nothing there is nothing more tragic than death that's it like this is the biggest thing that could happen to you so right. you may as well just live every day focusing on what you could produce while you're here. The other day I was reading um, this really interesting quote that I don't know it in exact uh, words, but, but I'll, I'll translate it in my own. Basically, it was saying something about we think that we live once, but in reality, we actually die once. Mm. that we live every day mm -hmm. and and it's it's really up to us how we want to make every day count and what we do so you know, that's that's one of the biggest things i think that fear is one of the most dangerous emotions if it's not put in check and kept in balance and um at the root of me be, being fearless also is my strong self-awareness and deep deep understanding of who I really am and that I may have a weakness, that I may make mistakes and I may fail because that is part of our human experience and path to growth. And I'm okay with that. Like I'm not scared to give up the pretension of invulner invulnerability because... I am really fully committed to making myself a better version every single day because mm -hmm. I'm going to die once <laughs> <laughs> and I'm here every day. So, um, so, you know, it, and, and really that, that kind of awareness is not about making public announcements and telling people, oh, today I discovered this about myself. So tomorrow meet me on the other <laughs> side. <laughs> right. Um, it's really an internal conversation that I, I have with myself all the time. And I think that we all should have with mm -hmm. ourselves because having a constructive critique towards ourselves really puts us in check and what we're doing wrong and it gives us the opportunity to put ourselves in the right direction like shift and improve ourselves to get to a better place so it's embracing vulnerability but also standing in the power of it not not breaking because of it just admit it put it out there grow from it learn and keep moving you know I'm, I'm a very rational person so I tend to rationalize a lot of things and, and I think that that helps me not to fall prey for cynicism for example or deception of or disillusionment so I'm comfortable with looking at myself and saying we need to work on this together <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and and also I I think I'm fearless naturally. There's part of it that's natural. Big part of it was, like I mentioned, like the learning experience, facing a lot of things on a regular basis. It just builds that courage over time. And you become more, you know, aggressive about getting things done better. Not against other people, but you making things better for yourself so you could produce better results for everyone around you. Yeah, you're not so, yeah. kidding because you already talked about wanting to listen to this interview yeah. so you can improve your ability to interact. Yes. You know that you definitely practice what you preach, and uh, it's powerful. That whole topic of having courage to look at your own and assess yourself and, and see where you make mistakes that takes a a special kind of you're confident, but you also understand 
I'm going to make some errors. And the today me isn't going to be as good as the 10 days from now or the 10 years from now me. And if you can't see the mistakes, then by using your design thinking, how are you going to resolve those things into a better version of yourself? So it's it's a really powerful way to to live your life. It is. Yeah. I think that just, you know, thinking of every day as a new day. And yeah, I mean, that's, that is, we have every day the power to recreate ourselves and who we want to be. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And also I think that um, fearlessness in itself, you know, as a, as an attitude, as a concept, it's, it requires reprogramming because it is a pattern. It's, it's really a pattern of conversations that we have with ourselves. And I think that our inner voice is and can be our harshest critic. Yes. And especially when we are, we are facing setbacks, for example. So it's crucial to being able to nurture ourselves too. And, you know, instead of the emotional beating that we give ourselves and, and the mistakes that we that we do, you know, when efforts are stalled or obstacles come come along the way. So it's good to have that and say it's okay. A number of the so I've done a lot of work in the Middle East myself in conflict zones where war has been constant. And one of the things I've learned from the people that have, have moved back here or I've interacted with, and these are folks from the Middle East, they'll say things to me like, none of this stuff in the future matters. It will never be as hard as what I endured when I was, and then they fill in the blank with their, mm. their story of, of tragedy. Uh, do you identify with that? Like I, there's, there can be no harder point than day to day survival. So this is all things I don't have to be afraid of these mistakes because I've it's already not a life and death situation. Yeah. 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 I mean, I've done the same thing. I'm like, this will either work or it won't. I will put the effort in that's required to make, you know, that I can do my best, but if it doesn't happen, you know, I've had bullets go by my face. <laughs> You know, it's like, it's nothing compared to that. You know, I think that um, those are two different things. I think that life death is one thing and life life is something else. Mm. I think we, you know, with a life death situation, we're dealing with black and white. I'm either here or I'm not. But when you're living, when you're here, when you're life life, you're every day I'm here and I die once, you are facing problems on daily basis. You're you're prone to that because you're here. If you die, you're no longer dealing with that. It right. might have been that you went through that process of facing the fear or or really tapping into that instinct of survival that you probably wouldn't have felt if you were not under threat of death. But I think that the life-life situation is definitely harder if you think about it because you are here and you're dealing with problems every day. Right. You know, you're, you're here. And the life death situation with talking about wars and crises and things like that, it's a very particular experience that luckily, and I hope that not the whole whole world would experience this ever because now there's so much of it still happening and I'm sure. sure it will continue to happen in the future because it's human nature and aggression and conflict is part of our dark side. But, you know, I, I just think that it's a very particular experience that not a lot of people could really, really understand if they didn't live through it. So, you know, to the person who have experienced that, that, that might have been the most traumatic thing. But sure. to a person who is down the street from us living on the street with no shelter no food every day that's their life life situation yes for them that's a whole other perspective on what trauma is about Mm. it's not about you know a bullet is going to go through my head actually there is an opportunity for me to survive better but i don't have it yeah you know so so things are within control things are out of control it just shapes our perspectives very differently yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And back to talking about, um, you know, fear, fearlessness too, because it's such a, you know, interesting topic and from really a psychological is. standpoint. <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, I, I noticed, for example, that people that have broken this, this kind of barrier with death or with extreme situations and have dealt with um, a lot of setbacks, for example, they are, you know, and I'm personally one of those people is that, you know, when I'm when I'm dealing with others, they usually tell, they just sense that I'm not scared. And I think part of that is because I'm very authentic with people. Like I, what I say is what I am. And if you want to see me, you can, because I'm telling you. 
But if you refuse to, then it's your problem. So authenticity and having that openness and saying what you what you really think, I think it's it's major to breaking the fear because a lot of us are held back by saying our truth. This is really what I think. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot of courage to get to that point. It's like fear of judgment or fear of judgment, fear of being vulnerable again. Right. Like you don't want your opinion to be stated the way you you feel or you think or um, you don't want to be misunderstood or you don't want to have conflict if there isn't that courage to face differences right and I think that's part of why people tend to hide who they really are because they are not trained well to confront the truth right right so it's about being comfortable in your own skin exactly. recognizing where it is that you need to do the work and yes. from that point is where you really get the strength and courage to be fearless absolutely because it takes that level of if you're not honest then you're insecure mm -hmm. you're definitely are not there you don't have the courage if you can't say exactly what you see the truth as it is as it is if you can't take it as it is that means that the courage needs to be developed the strength is not there and that's one of the biggest things when it comes to fearlessness for sure mm -hmm. yeah. truth it's it's the most dangerous thing to face mm -hmm. really and if you can't say it, it's the easiest the simplest mm -hmm. and the hardest thing to do and a lot of, a lot of people fail to be truthful and to be authentic in who they are what they think what's on their mind or see it when when it's presented to them yeah so this is a big shortcut i think if we all use that our lives will be so much better. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I think that, yeah, this, this conversation has given us um, so much to think about and take in. And it's been um, a really amazing conversation. Is there any parting thoughts that you'd like to leave us with? I really enjoyed this conversation with you. It's such a pleasure. Us to too. Us awesome. Yeah, awesome. Sure. <laughs> such awesome. a pleasure to be on the show. And I think I said everything that I had on my mind. Awesome. <laughs> so great. We'll, we'll if I, if I missed up. anything, we'll make another episode. Yeah, fill your mind up again. <laughs> Let's, we want yeah. more. We want Absolutely. more for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's really been it's such a great conversation. I, I can't wait to listen to it again, actually. Yeah, and you're off on a big adventure. I'm so excited about this. You don't know how much I love to travel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can't wait to learn new things and see new things. Great. Well, thank you, Rania. Thank you so much. <laughs>